This week, we're going to be talking about regime types, democracy, and dictatorship. We classify regimes into type, democratic, communist, and so on, in order to compare them better. People have been thinking about politics in terms of regime types, at least since Aristotle wrote the politics around 350 BC. It's worth noting that typology doesn't explain anything, however. It organizes our information. It's like the periodic table for comparativists. And every so often, a new regime type will be discovered, by which we mean it will be found useful to help explain similarities and differences between phenomena of interest. It's worth noting that unlike the periodic table, uh, regime types aren't natural kinds. Uh, we classify regimes because we find it useful to do so, not because they are natural types of regimes out there that we uh, can discover uh, through scientific investigation. Instead, what we're just doing is we're looking at uh, commonalities and we're trying to figure out what makes uh, certain types of countries different from other types of countries. And once we see some patterns, we start classifying those regimes. So what is a regime? Well, regimes are sets of institutions that determine how power will be distributed within a state. I like to think of regimes as being set by constitutions. When constitutions fundamentally change, then the regime has changed. So, for example, when uh, the Russian Empire became the Soviet Union in 1918, the regime type changed. And when the Soviet Union crumbled back into uh, the Russian Republic uh, in 1991, the regime type changed again. Note that we're talking about the same state more or less, and we're talking about a lot of the same people. But what we're noting is that the fundamental way in which political power is distributed within uh, that territory and among those people has changed. So a state might therefore incur multiple regime changes, just noted with the USSR. Uh, and this is very similar to a company, a firm that might survive several rounds of restructuring but still be the same company. Uh, a regime will normally see many different governments. Now, what that means is that a government or an administration is just a set of people who hold executive power. So since the United States Constitution was ratified in, what, 17... 17- 91. In 1791, you know, we've had 45 presidents, uh, and each of those presidents has had one or more administrations. And so, although the regime hasn't really changed because the Constitution hasn't changed that much, uh, what we, we can still talk about different governments uh, occupying positions within a given more or less stable set of rules for selecting uh, office holders. Uh, so when a new chief executive takes office, we often say that we have a change of government. When a cabinet ministry reshuffling occurs, we have a change in the government. It's also easy to confuse uh, regime type and ideology, I have to say, but it's really important to keep them distinct. Right? Political ideology is a set of ideas that attempts to justify power relationships. Uh, in other words, it's a set of values that we appeal to in order to say, oh, these regime types are good and these regime types are bad. Um, but regime types themselves are sets of institutions for allocating political power. Uh, they can be good or bad, but we're just looking at what the rules are for distributing political power. So if we say that North Korea is a communist regime, there's a little bit of an ambiguity there because it's not clear whether we're making a claim about North Korea's method of allocating political power or if we're making a claim about the ideologies that are used to justify its policies. Um, including perhaps its method of allocating political power. In other words, uh, is North Korea communist because uh, all the people inside it believe in communism, or is it communist because uh, a communist method of allocating political power is used to, in fact, allocate political power within that country? Now, in empirical political science, we're more interested in the sets of rules, uh, the regime types, than we are in the ideologies. But we have to be clear, because not everybody uh, makes that distinction quite so neatly. Okay, let's get to democracy. What's a democracy, and how can we tell if a country is a democracy? Uh, first of all, it's a contested term, uh, and in part because po positive connotations attached to it, there's a tendency to use the word democratic to mean anything that we like, uh, so as a term of praise. Uh, but we have to be clear. Uh, democracies may have attributes uh, that we like and attributes that we don't like. And the regime types um, may be good or bad, uh, and democratic or not, and those two things may not always go together. There might be non-democracies that are fairly decent regimes, and there may be democracies that are quite tyrannical. Now, 
Comparativists are, again, uh, usually more interested in describing sets of rules or relations of power than attributing praise or blame. So uh, they tend to have more technical definitions than the average person on the street. Indeed, I'll add also that philosophers tend to have uh, less technical definitions and more idealistic or aspirational definitions of democracy uh, to the point where uh, some philosophers have definitions of democracies that uh, don't that we can't find anywhere in the world. That is to say, no democracy can or perhaps even could meet uh, those lofty standards. More on that later in the course, though. How do we translate our more or less abstract ideas about democracy into a practical set of criteria for classifying regimes? Well, two ways of doing it. One, you classify the regimes in terms of the sorts of outcomes they produce for the people. Things like inequality, civil rights, civil liberties. Uh, these are outcomes that we can go measure. We can see uh, whether uh, people have civil rights, whether people uh, are more or less unequal along different dimensions. and. Uh, then we can say, well, the places that are more equal and where there's more civil rights and liberties are the places that are more democratic. Uh, and then you have a procedural view. Uh, the procedural view classifies political regimes in terms of their institutions or procedures for allocating offices, just like it sounds. On this view, uh, you're not looking at whether or not people are free or not, but you're just looking at how uh, decisions about their freedom are being determined, and uh, generally it has something to do with, with elections and uh, alternation of power and things like that. Uh, and that will tell you whether a country is democratic or not. But of course, on that view, uh, democracy is not necessarily liberal, it's not necessarily egalitarian, uh, it's its own thing. One important uh, and influential way of classifying institutions procedurally is by looking at two important dimensions. Inclusion and contestation. Inclusion uh, refers to how many groups get to participate in politics, right? So we say that when a country, or on this view, when a country gives women the right to vote, it becomes more democratic. When it reduces barriers for minorities to vote, then again, it becomes more democratic. So how many groups are included uh, when it lowers the voting age, you might say, uh, from 21 to 18, as they did in the United States? then it becomes, again, more democratic because it becomes more inclusive. The second dimension of this measure is contestation. How much political competition is there for public offices? And you can measure this in different ways. You can talk about the number of political parties. You can talk about the share of the vote of different political parties. You can talk about the difference in vote tally between first and second. Um, it really depends on, on the system. but. Uh, Systems where you have a lot of contestation uh, are presumably more democratic than where systems where um, the government does not have to compete much uh, with other parties for uh, political office. There's three indexes of democracy, really, that um, most political scientists are familiar with. There's a democracy dictatorship index, uh, abbreviated DD, there's the polity four index, and there's the freedom house index. And I want to talk about each of these very briefly. Democracy dictatorship uh, is in some ways the simplest and the most minimalist of these indexes of democracy. It basically says a country is a democracy if the chief executive is elected, if the legislature is elected, if there's more than one political party competing in elections, and there has been an alternation in power under identical electoral rules. If these conditions hold, great, it's a democracy. If the country conditions do not hold, then it's automatically a dictatorship. And on this index, the country is either a democracy or a dictatorship, nothing in between. Polity 4 is a little bit different. Polity 4, you can be a mixed regime. There's democracies, dictatorships, and mixed regimes. Uh, it produces, uh, it's created by producing a, a score of democracy uh, from 0 to 10 and a score of autocracy, which is a fancy word for dictatorship, again, 0 to 10. The polity score is the democracy score, uh, I'm sorry, the autocracy score subtracted from the democracy score. Uh, what that means is that countries can range all the way from minus 10 to plus 10. Uh, and then somewhat arbitrarily, I think, uh, democracies are classified as any regime that falls between plus 6 and plus 10. Uh, dictatorship is anything that falls between minus 6 and minus 10. And then minus 5 to plus 5 is qualified as a mixed regime. I'm not going to talk much about polity 4. Uh, if you want, you can pause the video and look at the sort of different uh, characteristics. And we're going to skip right on to 
Freedom House. Now, Freedom House is one of the most widely used measures of democracy, and, and it's used uh, widely because it just collected a lot of data. And so there's a lot of interesting comparisons we can make thanks to the Freedom House uh, index. But it's also one of the most controversial. First of all, it's not really a measure of democracy. It's a measure of freedom. Uh, it's based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and how well uh, the various uh, articles of that declaration are fulfilled in practice in the different countries around the world. Uh, Freedom House uses two broad categories which are related to democracy, and that's why they're often used in, this, in the study of democracy, is because when we're talking about democracy, we're often talking about political rights and civil rights. Uh, political rights and civil rights are very much on the substantive end of democracy classifications uh, because they really look at outcomes, not at the process by which those outcomes are determined. Uh, like Polity 4, uh, Freedom House uh, dumps uh, countries into one of three categories, free, partly free, and not free, although again, sometimes people use the scores uh, in political and civil rights rather than the overall classification. Uh, and the scores uh, ranging from one to seven uh, provide a sort of more disaggregated, uh, fine-grained uh, measure for democracy. Again, we could talk a lot. In fact, we could take a very, very, very long time uh, to go through the Freedom House Index, which measures hundreds, at least a hundred questions, if not more. Um, and each of those is potentially controversial. Uh, and each of those is also the coding of which is also their inclusion is controversial uh, if we're trying to measure democracy. But their coding is also controversial because it requires people who are doing the coding, let us say people who are deciding whether or not a country meets a particular rule. Uh, well, yeah, whether a country meets a particular decision rule or not, uh, it requires those coders to, to make judgment calls that are not always obvious to make, and it's not clear that every coder would make the same judgment call. Uh, here are some examples of questions. Again, I'm going to skip through these, but types of questions for political rights, types of civil rights questions. Uh, you know, again, not all of these seem to have much to do with democracy. Are there free trade unions? Uh, there are probably conceptions of democracy where that would matter, but there's also plenty where it wouldn't. Um, okay. So if we look at a map of the world uh, where dictatorships and democracies are colored differently, uh, based on these three indexes, you can see that uh, the democracy dictatorship world has a lot more dictatorships. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot more willing to qualify countries as dictatorships. Uh, Polity 4 has a lot more gray areas, that is to say a lot more mixed regimes. Uh, Freedom House uh, also is sort of somewhere in between these two uh, in terms of how it classifies regimes. If we look more practically, what we see is that there's a high level of agreement at the upper and the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, very um, Authoritarian places are qualified as dictatorships in all of these um, indexes. Uh, very democratic places, again, are always democracies in all of these indices, and it's the mixed countries. It's the middle countries where things are a little bit all over the place and therefore um, cause the most worry uh, when we're doing cross-national analyses, when we're trying to compare countries, is, you know, a country like uh, Rwanda, um, well, it looks like it's mixed most of the times. I mean, I, actually, Botswana is the most interesting case here because, of course, the, the Botswana comes out as a dem dictatorship on the DD measure and a democracy on the other two. So what gives? Well, uh, I can tell you a little bit about, about Botswana because it is a country I have done uh, research on in the past. Um, first of all, Botswana is a mineral-rich country. It is a diamond-producing country, one of the biggest diamond-producing countries in the world. Uh, it's also one of the fastest growing, uh, or cons most consistently growing countries anyway, economically speaking, for the past 30 years. Um, and it has always been ruled by the same party, and that's where DD comes into play. It's because there has never been a peaceful alternation of power. Uh, although the elections look pretty free and fair, there's a fair amount of free speech. Uh, political dissenters are not repressed. Uh, there are multiple parties running in elections. It just so happens that the same party wins for 40 years in a row. And so we don't really know what would happen if that party lose, lost an election, right? If that party lost an election, would they willingly give up power? Uh, that's still an open question because it has never happened. So uh, for that reason, uh, Botswana does not meet the fourth category uh, for the DD uh, measure, and so therefore Botswana is classified as a dictatorship, uh, even though, again, on the surface, uh, it looks like a relatively free country.
I thought I'd also report some interesting uh, survey results. Uh, in uh, a few years ago, I forget how many how many years ago, probably two three years ago, Brightline did a survey of American political scientists. Um, so political science faculty at American um, universities. And I think I actually filled out this survey. And the survey was about um, democracy and what made a country uh, democratic. And so if we look at the results of the survey, uh, we see some agreement, but also some disagreement about what exactly is essential, important, beneficial, or not relevant to a democracy. Uh, so everybody agrees more or less that fraud-free elections, over 90% of respondents say that fraud-free elections are uh, essential to uh, a country being classified as democratic. Uh, but then there's other things where it's not so clear. Um, you know, at the lower end of the spectrum, uh, patriotism not being questioned, uh, you know, is not essential to almost anyone. Only 12% uh, think that that's essential. Uh, and even only 42% or so look like it's important. So I don't. I won't tell you how I answered these questions. I frankly don't remember in all cases, uh, but it does give you an idea that there is a variety of opinions here about um, what might uh, make a country democratic. It's also worth noting that the the same survey asked uh, these same political scientists how the United States was doing on all of these categories. And again, what we see is a fairly mixed picture. Um, political science faculty are not terribly convinced that the United States fully meets well almost any of these categories, with the exceptions of parties being allowed and fraud-free elections. And again, that's barely a majority right? of political science faculty think that the United States fully meets these categories. Uh, if we look at mostly meets, again, uh, things look a little bit better. But um, partly meets, does not meet. Well, does not meet, we have um, worries about uh, equal impact of votes. And of course, that's almost certainly true uh, in the United States uh, if you live in a large state uh, with uh, lots of people, your vote is worth a little bit less because we have a Senate which equally apportions uh, senators uh, regardless of the population in their state. And so not all votes have an equal impact. And of course, the Electoral College system also means that some states, namely swing states, uh, see voters have a tremendous impact on the outcome of an election, whereas uh, states uh, like Tennessee, for example, um, that are not terribly competitive. Uh, people's on, in most years uh, see people's votes not being worth quite as much. So again, um, how's the United States doing? Again, it's a matter of appreciation, but it's just worth noting that uh, there's also substantial disagreements about how the United States uh, is doing on a lot of these categories, but not all. Okay, so all of this brings us to one final question. Which measure of democracy should we pick? Well, I think the answer depends on what kind of question you have in mind. If you want to know how democracy relates to free speech or the protection of private property, I think it would be pretty silly to take the Freedom House measure because the Freedom House measure is already a measure of free speech and private property because it's a substantive measure of democracy. So if you want to answer that kind of question, you really need to take a more minimalist uh, index of democracy. So I think DD would be quite appropriate. Uh, if you want to know whether a country is more likely to go to war, however, I think there's a case to be made for more substantive measures. I'm not sure that it would be wrong to use DD, but you might think that the propensity to go to war has something to do with those substantive questions about, um, you know, protest and free speech and dissent and, you know, all of those outcomes of democracy that uh, might make it harder for countries that don't have them. Uh, to avoid war uh, because, again, uh, you don't have that popular feedback mechanism that you do in countries that do have them. And if that's the case, then uh, maybe you should use a Freedom House, which, which counts all of those things. So, you know, if you have a study, so, I mean, again, this is sort of the, the classic uh, problem with the Freedom House Index is that if uh, you find a positive relationship between democracy and economic development using a Freedom House Index, you have this difficulty of trying to figure out which of the 25 underlying attributes that count as, that are aggregated as part of the measure of democracy, which of these is actually driving the observed relationship? How do you know? Um, you're better off testing each of the 25 than you are using Freedom House because at the end of the day, uh, Freedom House seems to be measuring a lot of different things. Um, 
So by being minimal, measures like DD, I think, are better able to isolate the precise cause of phenomena. Is it really about democratic procedure, um, or is it about something something related but distinct? That being said, DD has a weakness, and the main weakness is that it really makes these categorical judgments. Either you're a democracy or you're not. That's really cut and dry, and there's a lot of cases, a lot of countries in the world where it's just not that simple. Um, and so I think there's a good case to be made for the notion that some democracies are, in fact, more democratic than others, and some dictatorships are more, uh, for want of a better word, dictatorial than others. Uh, and DD doesn't capture that. Uh, so. If you're using a measure of democracy, particularly as a de dependent variable, if you're trying to, in other words, explain democracy or the intensity of democracy uh, or changes in the quality of democracy, then uh, you're better off using what we call a continuous variable, right? A variable that uh, essentially has many, many degrees to it. Um, because then you can capture uh, small shifts uh, and that would not be captured by uh, a dichotomous one where it's just one or the other. Um, you don't capture small changes uh, when you're using uh, the DD variable as your uh, dependent variable, as the thing you were trying to explain. Quick note on validity and reliability. Uh, let's discuss validity first. Validity refers to the extent to which our measures correspond to the concepts they're intended to reflect. Um, so when you have multiple components, you really have to think long and hard about whether each of them are worth uh, the same. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, in baseball, they use this statistic, some of you might be familiar with it, called OPS. It's on base plus slugging percentage. It's your on base percentage plus your slugging percentage. Um, and it's a rough measure of the offensive output of a particular player. How much power do they display and then how often are they on base? And I, I think that's not a bad idea, but uh, these things are weighted equally. It's just one plus the other. And I think a question legitimately arises whether the ability to get on base or the ability to hit a home run is more important or not. Um, you might think that the value of a player um, is higher if they can hit more home runs. And if you were trying to sign a player um, to figure out how much you want to pay them, uh, you might say that uh, the more spectacular players are going to bring more people to the park, are going to generate more excitement and more buzz about the team, uh, and generally be better for your franchise to have. So you really want to value perhaps power uh, more than on base percentage. On the other hand, if you're uh, trying to figure out whether a player is going to help you win championships or not, uh, you might actually uh, value on base percentage more. After all, uh, Baseball is a game of 27 outs, and uh, the less likely your players are to make outs, the more likely you are to win the game, all else being equal. Again, it's complicated, but my point is, is that you don't, it's not a given that two measure, two, the two parts of your index, or more parts of your index, have to be equally weighted. You could weight them differently. Uh, and so you have to kind of decide, uh, and that decision is often arbitrary about which is going to be more important. For different purposes, I would argue different components of the index are going to be more important. Um, okay, uh, enough on validity, but it just gives you an idea that, that it's really complicated to try to figure out um, how you want to measure uh, all of these things. Nominal, interval, and ordinal, I'm going to let go. Um, Reliability, yes. So many of these scores require researchers to make judgment calls about whether or not a country meets a particular decision rule. Are the elections free and fair or not? That's a decision rule. It's not a very good decision rule because it's not very precise, but you can see that different people might disagree about how free and how fair elections have to be or how much intimidation or how little intimidation there has to be uh, at the ballot box before they're willing to uh, say, uh, no, it's not free and fair. And so it really has to be the case for an index to be reliable that everybody would score uh, the country the same way according to the decision rule that's specified by the index. And that's just not always the case. So a measure is reliable to the extent that it's measuring something accurately. Uh, DD is highly reliable because it relies on only observable measures, measures about which pe few people would disagree. Was there an alternate, a peaceful 
alternation in power. I mean, I guess we could quibble about what counts as peaceful, but by and large, I think people are going to agree on that one. Uh, whereas Polity 4 and Freedom House are going to require a lot of more subjective judgment calls, and that means that different people are going to come down different ways on the same question, and that's going to make those measures a little bit less reliable. Okay, in conclusion, comparative political scientists uh, try to figure out how to group countries into different regime types, and there's a lot of ink spilled about uh, trying to figure out the best way to classify countries. Um, democracy and dictatorship, of course, are two important uh, types of regimes, but each of these hides a lot of variation. What kind of democracy? What kind of dictatorship? Are you a communist dictatorship? Are you a fascist dictatorship? Are you some sort of modernizing authoritarian dictatorship? And then in democracy, as we'll see in coming weeks, uh, there's also many, many shades of democracy. So depending on the question you want to ask, uh, I think the subtypes, the type of democracy and the type of dictatorship are going to matter almost as much uh, as whether it's a democracy or a dictatorship in the first place. Okay, that was a very long lecture. Uh, if you've stayed till the end, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask.